Hi, I'm Maximus, and today I'm going to talk about the origin of eukaryotic cells. Principia Sutra, Episode 2, Endosymbiosis. So endosymbiosis is a theory that was put forward by Lynn Margulis in the late 60s, and she argued it until her death in 2011. To start off, you know, the simple question is, what is a eukaryotic cell? So there are many different kinds of eukaryotic cells. Plants, animals, and fungi are all made up of eukaryotic cells as well as single cellular proteins, but what they all have in common is a nucleus. Eukaryotic cells have specialized organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus and lysosomes and all of these other fun microbiological words. And also, eukaryotic cells are much bigger, in some cases thousands of times larger than prokaryotes. So the question we have to ask is, how did prokaryotes, which we know came first, evolve into eukaryotic cells? The answer is really fascinating. It turns out that the best way to conceptualize what a eukaryotic cell is, is actually a dynamic collection of individual autonomous prokaryotic partners. Margulis points out four symbiotic mergers that were necessary in order for the animals, plants, fungi, and proteins we see today to exist. Those four mergers produce chloroplast, mitochondria, flagellum, and importantly, the nucleus. So those four claims are supported by differing amounts of evidence, and actually, although Margulis argued for it until her dying day, we have pretty strong evidence now that flagellum are not from symbiotic origin. Margulis' theory was criticized quite strongly until scientists found evidence for DNA in both mitochondria and chloroplasts. Further studies showed that not only do mitochondria and chloroplasts have distinct sequences of DNA inside their membranes, but that they have independent reproductive cycles. This means that in many ways, mitochondria and chloroplasts are relatively autonomous from the other parts of the eukaryotic cell. But in some very central ways, mitochondria and chloroplasts are not autonomous from the greater cell at all. The genes that are required for mitochondria and chloroplast maintenance and production have been outsourced to the nucleus, meaning that these organelles can no longer live independently outside of their hosts. The nature of evidence for the endosymbiosis of mitochondria and chloroplasts takes the form of observing DNA where it typically isn't. This logic obviously can't provide evidence for the endosymbiotic origin of the nucleus because that's where the DNA is supposed to be. However, given the fact that other symbiotic mergers are known to have occurred, it does make intuitive sense that the nucleus would be of endosymbiotic origin. Like mitochondria and chloroplasts, the nucleus is membrane-bound, which is a hallmark of autopoiesis. Although we don't have definitive evidence for an endosymbiotic origin of the nucleus, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, and the few studies done suggest that at the very least it is a likely possibility. Source in the description. To summarize, we have strong evidence suggesting that endosymbiosis occurred in two separate instances, mitochondria and chloroplasts, and have strong reason to investigate a third instance, the nucleus. But how did these mergers occur? To answer that question, we need to examine the structure of the organelles involved. Mitochondria can be viewed as the ultimate heterotrophic machine. They specialize in converting glucose into more usable ATP, and they do this with remarkable efficiency. Likewise, chloroplasts can be viewed as the ultimate autotrophic machine. They specialize in converting sunlight into glucose, and also do this with remarkable efficiency. In other words, mitochondria and chloroplasts make up the heart of all living metabolism. Together, they are responsible for converting energy from the sun, light, into the hallmarks of life, growth, motion, and even consciousness. When life began 4 billion years ago, metabolism was not nearly this sophisticated nor as efficient. It took billions of years for these complex metabolic pathways to evolve. For the first 2 billion years of life on Earth, life exists solely as very small prokaryotic cells. No mitochondria, no chloroplasts, no nucleus. But it would be a mistake to think that because the first half of life's history is dominated by prokaryotic life, that nothing interesting was happening. All of the major chemical reactions that life relies on today evolved during this period. Some prokaryotic cells became very, very good and efficient at capturing sunlight and converting it into energy. These were the first autotrophs. Other early prokaryotic cells were the first heterotrophs, predators that would absorb their autotrophic brethren and absorb the energy that they had acquired. After millions of years of evolution, these early predators necessarily became very large. The bigger they were, the more food that they could acquire, and the harder they were to kill. The size of these large predator cells meant that their metabolic pathways were necessarily less efficient than their smaller brethren. But this was okay, because they didn't have to be very fast if they were large and domineering. But of course, an ecosystem consisting only of the eaters and the eaten is not a closed loop. Tiny scavengers were necessary to, to complete the cycle. These scavengers were experts at efficiently absorbing and using energy. Because they couldn't rely on size to defend them, they had to make sure that they were using their energy very efficiently. These scavengers were likely the first mitochondria. 
We'll never know the details of this story for certain, and in fact, everything that I just said might be completely wrong. Or at the very least, it's a gross oversimplification. But the point I'm trying to make is that two billion years ago, the oceans of Earth were filled with relatively simple prokaryotic cells that filled very specific niches, often with complementary functions. The stage was set for a revolutionary synthesis. Those first mitochondria may have been scavengers, or they may have been parasites, but at some point, a major transition occurred and a mutualistic relationship evolved. Those proto-mitochondria were absorbed into their host's interior, perhaps as prey, but rather than being digested, they started to perform a remarkable service. The mitochondria could digest food more efficiently than the host. By maintaining a living population of mitochondria within its membrane, the host cell secured a quick and reliable form of digestion. And in exchange, the mitochondria receive a safe place to live, free from predators, and with an abundant food supply. Life inside the host became so cushy for the mitochondria that it quickly lost many of the adaptations that it needed to survive in the outside world. Even some of its genes were outsourced to the nucleus of the host. And likewise, the host too soon lost many of its native digestive pathways. Why digest food when there's a creature inside you that can do it better? The story of chloroplasts is much the same. Around two billion years ago, the ancestors of modern cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, evolved the ability to turn water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight into sugar. These ancestral chloroplasts were obviously very tasty, and they were consumed by the trillions. But then, rather than breaking down the consumed bacteria, something happened that allowed the protochloroplast to stay alive inside the cell membrane of the monster that had eaten it. It started making sugars for its host, and the ancestors of modern plants were born. Is born the right word? Perhaps I should say synthesized. We know that endosymbiosis of mitochondria occurred before that of chloroplasts because virtually all living eukaryotes contain mitochondria while only plants and some proteins contain chloroplasts. I'd like to conclude this video by exploring some of the philosophical implications of endosymbiosis. Endosymbiosis forces us to recognize that anastomosis is a powerful evolutionary force. Anastomosis is the opposite of branching, when paths fuse together rather than split. Speciation is typically taught to occur when a branch in the tree of life separates. There's some disruptive selection and now you've got big beaked finches and small beaked finches where before you just had medium beaked finches. But endosymbiosis shows that anastomosis, the fusing of very different life forms in evolutionary histories, has had a profound, profound effect on life as we know it. Each cell in your body is the synergistic collaboration of many formerly discrete beings. What was once identified as other is now identified as self. The most important events in the history of life occurred not when the fittest survived, but when former enemies, predators and prey, parasite and host, merged together, forming something new and never before seen. Lynn Margulis writes, Evolution is no linear family tree, but a change in a single, multi-dimensional being that has grown to cover the entire surface of the Earth. We are vast. We contain multitudes. Thank you for watching. Next week's episode will be on the evolution of multicellularity.